Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live today. It's Saturday, April the 27th, 2013. Our topic today is teaching art in a technology-rich and connected classroom, and our featured teacher is Trisha Fugelstead. I want to start off right off the show, giving a special shout out and thanks to Tammy Moore in the chat for providing closed captioning, and Laurie Moffat for being our backup uh, moderator and helping Kim out with our questions today. Just a quick reminder that we do have a live binder set up for today, and Peggy is probably going to drop in the link any second. But please pay special attention to that link because we're going to be asking you maybe to refer to it a little bit later. And it's a great way, if you're not familiar with it, to uh, aggregate all the resources and links that uh, Trisha will be sharing with us today. And another reminder that you'll find that link on our uh, archives and resources page of our website live.classroom20.com along with a uh, MP3 file, a embedded video file, the actual full Blackboard Collaborate recording, and wonderfully a record of the chat log. So it's a great way to keep uh, up with uh, all the information and can pass it on to any of your um, our friends and co-workers who might be interested in the topic of today, and the information shared by Trisha. And always, you can always go back and get the links later on um, if you happen to step out or miss something during the day. So we always like to get you started with the web. Um, my networking shows where you're located on the map. So everyone needs to find that laser pointer, which is in the left-hand side of the whiteboard, the second one down. If you click on that little uh, starburst and drag it across to where you're located in the world. And some people like Peggy in Phoenix, Arizona have it quite hot. I'm in St. Catharines, Ontario. It's lovely sunny today. But yes, like Tammy, I had to put my coat on yesterday. It was quite cool. So we're a little jealous, Peggy, of the temperature. So please go ahead, everyone, and if make that laser pointer work. We seem to be North America at the moment. Um, if you can't make the laser pointer work, please just type where you're located in the world. Yes, Peggy, I hope we're not going to have any problems with uh, logging in. Argentina, terrific. Welcome. Must be turning into winter in Argentina, though. Thanks, everyone. I'm going to move on now to the poll questions. And so we're going to use the little poll option with the check mark underneath your name on the right. And the first question is, does anyone here teach BART? Green check if it's a yes, and red X if it's a no. I'll give you a second to drop in your vote. And then um, I'll collate the results and publish them to the whiteboard, which I'm going to do right about now. Right about now. It's not working. Someone else publish, please. I've tried that link twice now. And I seem to have that. Wonderful issue frequently. Great. Thanks very much. So, Tricia, a large number of us are not art teachers, and I hope that helps you uh, with your presentation today. I'm going to move on to the next poll question. Thanks for clearing the votes, Kim. And the second poll question is, would you call your classroom technology rich? So that's a green check if it's a yes, and red X if it's a no. I'm just waiting for the votes. Well, Kim, could you go ahead and, and publish them anyway? I think we need to move on to the next question. So would you call your classroom technology rich? And the answers are, let's take a look at that. Yes, most people who are voting with us today um, agree with that question, that they are working in a classroom rich in technology. So Kim, I need to change the voting options to A to D, I believe, for our next poll question, which is, which of these is the largest audience that views your students' work? School A, B, the parent community, C, the city, and D, the world. So we've got four choices. Go ahead and vote. Let's 
still waiting for a few people to cast their vote. I think that's most of us right now. You want to go ahead? So, what's the breakdown? 20% the school, uh, much less the parent community. Not much in the city, but the world, a different matter. So, uh, the school and the world seem to be um, having a good competition about equal uh, influence. Thanks, everybody, for the poll questions. And I just want to remind you to keep that link for the live binder in the back of your mind. Well, I formally introduce our featured teacher today, Tricia Fugelstead. Um, Tricia is a National Board Certified Teacher, certified in 07. She's a K-5 art teacher at Dryden Elementary School in Arlington Heights, Illinois. She is the National Arts Education Associate Western Region Elementary Art Teacher of the Year 2013. And she was honored with the Teacher of Distinction title from the Golden Apple Foundation 2012 in the 2011 Illinois Art Teacher of the Year and was one of the 10 nationwide to receive the 2010 PBS Teachers Innovation Awards. And I know Trisha's going to share more about her background in a minute. I'm going to turn over the mic to Trisha. It's always our lead-in question uh, during the Feature Teacher Show is, what does Web 2.0 mean to you and why do you use Web 2.0 tools in your classroom? So welcome, Trisha. The microphone is yours. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you. Um, so Web 2.0 means giving my students an audience, basically. So I'm using these tools to make connections online and build a network for my students so they can have an authentic audience. And I'm definitely going to talk about that in my presentation. Does that cover it? OK. Thank you very much. I've just moved you on to the next slide. Ready to go. OK, wonderful. So um, before I get into my whole spiel today, I want to give you a little heads up that there is a um, raffle at the end. And if you do a good job paying attention, and you also find that live binder, because that is like your cheat sheet, if you, if you will, you'll do well on the raffle, and you'll be able to win some really cool prizes donated by Doink, which um, makes a very cool animation app for the iPad. OK, so I'm um, like, thank you very much for that introduction. And I don't think I need to repeat who I am as far as um, a kindergarten through fifth grade art teacher. I'm in Chicago, if you didn't catch that, which is a suburb of Chicago. Or, no, so it's a, I'm in Arlington Heights, which is a suburb of Chicago. Sorry. And um, so what I want to share with you today is my definition of what it means to be technology rich and connected and what that looks like and how that has benefited my students. We're going to start out by taking a peek in my art room. And we're not going to do this as a web tour. Actually, we're going to click on a link that I think Peggy is going to drop into the chat window that will lead you to a three-minute video. And so you're going to watch this independently. So you have to click the link. And then what I'd like you to do is give me a check mark, the green check mark next to your name. You know, it looks like this, the way we did that in the poll, if you're all set. And then when I see a lot of green check marks, I know it's ready to we're ready to move on. OK? So you've got video link there. There it is. OK, go ahead, take a click, and peek at my art room.
tired and seeing a lot of green chest marks. So hopefully that worked out for you and you were able to take a peek into my art room. In um, my district, we've embraced the TPAC framework, which is the interplay of the knowledge of what we teach, the best practices involved to teach it, and the technology tools to effectively teach it. So using technology in itself is not my goal. I use technology when I see that it's a better way to deliver content and engage my students or enhance their learning experience. And if it doesn't meet that criteria, I just don't use it. So I have to reach every child that enters my room, whether it's the one that you know has an art-related party, birthday party, and they all make art t-shirts, or the one that's really distracted and needs me to get their attention because they just aren't listening, or the one that's goofy and wants to make smart remarks. So using technology is helping me create a really engaging learning environment for my students and reaching all of my learners. So what does it mean to be technology rich? Um, well, to me, it's simply having the tools available when you want to use them. And that's the key for teachers. You can't play on a technology lesson if you don't know if you'll be able to sign out the iPads or you don't have your interactive board installed on the wall, you have to wheel it into your room and somebody else already planned a lesson for that. So you're not able to implement the technology lessons in an environment like that. So to be technology rich, you have to have it available. And the district doesn't necessarily hand you technology, or at least it didn't for me. I have a technology-rich environment because I thought it out. And so a long time ago, I started writing grants. And we had um, the idea of making our schoolhouse rock. So we wanted to make songs that would teach art concepts. And so we wrote some grants to get a way to plug in my guitar to the computer. And I'm not a huge, big deal musician at all, like form chords, I think. And then um, we also had um, a MIDI keyboard that we were able to get to the grant and some things with GarageBand. And that started some songwriting with my students. And then we turned it into storytelling and wrote some grants to get green screen and cameras. I thought, you know what, these cameras are amazing. What if we got more and we could do stop motion animation? Or what if I had some really easy little flip video cameras that I could put into the hands of the kids and they could document their learning or interview each other about their learning? And then again, the iPads came out. So I needed to write some grants to get at least one teacher iPad. And then um, my school had um, the chance to get a class set of iPads. So I had to write a grant to get enough copies of an app to put on all the iPads for the building and some drawing statuses. And so I did that for a joint, and we're going to talk more about joints later. And we also do fundraising. Um, at our school, we have an online digital art gallery on Artsonia. And Artsonia not only is a working portfolio for my students where they could track their learning, their growth over time, but also parents can view their children's artwork and um, if they purchase something that features their children's artwork, Artsonia gives 20% back to the art room. So because of Artsonia, we were able to get a projector, interactive whiteboard, digital cameras, and all the supplies we need to burn digital portfolios for our graduating students. We also make videos to earn technology or win technology. So we use technology to get more technology. And we're actually in the process of trying to do that right now, which I'll tell you about later because I might need your help. But um, we've made videos about uh, what it would be like if we could have a technology makeover in the art room. We make videos about how um, we have 21st century skills using technology. And we enter these into contests, and sometimes that results in more technology for our art room. 
You know, what does it mean to be a connected classroom is my next question. Well, I'm going to give you a quote from Dr. Craig Rowland, who's the University of Florida, Florida Art Ed professor and founder of Art Ed 2.0. He said, the things that happen in Trisha's art room don't stay in Trisha's art room. And he's referring to the fact that the classroom learning and discoveries and the student art that my students create all go online. We have um, a school website, our online digital art gallery. I blog about it. I tweet about it. I go to Ning's and share things on the Art Ed 2.0 Ning. Um, there's Facebook posts. There's Animoto videos. There's Vimeo that hosts all of our Fugal Flex. There's Wikispaces, Pinterest, and I also do a podcast through Art or about Arts Roundtable is the name of it, and it's through edreach.us. So there's a lot of things online you can find out about the learning that goes on in my room. But it's reciprocal, because this has helped me build a personal learning network where I've got people I can ask questions to and learn from. And you know, just the other day, I was at a conference. I learned a trick from Wesley Fryer. I was able to learn about Audio and it worked for my students and we had this amazing um, experience doing live tweets and audio booths from our field trip to the Art Institute of Chicago. And I, so I saw that there was a West here, so I'm wondering if that's the same Wesley Fryer. But thank you again for that tip. And it's making a difference for my students when I'm connected like this. And that's what I really want to focus on today is how being technology rich and connected in our art room has given an authentic audience for my students' creative projects. It's really motivated them. They try their best because they know that people are looking and, and watching what they're doing. And that is so energizing and exciting. Our first story is about Young Sloppy Brush. This is what my website used to look like in 2006. I didn't have a lot of social networks then. I wasn't very connected. And it was kind of a one-way thing. I would make, I would share what we're doing on our website. And we just began making student-created art-related movies that we called Fugal Flix. And I would post them to a very small audience. I think I was part of an art education listserv. And so I put it on my website and then shared a link to a couple hundred people on the listserv. Well, one day I got a message from somebody who read it, who looked at my link and saw a video. The video was called um, Be Kind to Your Racers. And it was, it kind of touched on a universal theme for art teachers. Racers get destroyed. And the video was meant to try to stop that terrible, horrible event or a thing from happening in the classroom. And then when she wrote to me, she said, wouldn't it be wonderful if you did a movie or a fugal flick about paintbrushes so that they would you know, not be destroyed anymore? Because that's another universal issue in the art room. So I proposed this to my fifth grade students. And I told them, hey, you're going to have an audience for this. If we can make a movie that would put an end to the destruction of poor paintbrushes, then we could share it with this art teacher in Texas who wrote us. And that was extremely motivating to my students, so much so that 25 fifth graders gave up their lunch recesses for uh, like three weeks so that they could write a script, create an original song, and you know, decorate brushes like this and animate it all, well, actually act it out with their hands in the back of the room and create this really endearing little story. It's a tragic story, actually, and it's a musical um, about this young sloppy brush who was once a handsome brush who turned evil and sloppy in the hands of a careless artist. And the story was about four minutes long. And it, when we shared it, you know, we knew we had our audience in Texas. But I thought, you know what? I wonder if there is a, a bigger audience for this. So I went around searching in the local newspaper, and I found that there was a brand new first annual student video um, film festival in a nearby suburb. 
So I said, you know what, this is it. And it was accepting newbies from 5th graders to 12th graders. And it was perfect. So we went ahead and entered Young Slappy Brush into the local film festival. And I thought, this is awesome. We're going to get a live audience. My students are going to be able to hear the audience react to their movie. They, um, at this film festival, they invited the kids to come up on stage and they fielded questions from the audience and they talked about the movie making experience. It was such a rich experience and authentic assessment too. Like, did you really learn something in the whole process? So I love this, but what was even better is one of the judges of this contest was a scout for an international film festival. So not only did my students take Best to Show in this film festival with their movie, which was extremely exciting, but because of that connection with the judge working for an international children's film festival, we were able to have more audiences. It was entered into the Kids for Kids film festival in Naples, Italy. And it also played at the Chicago International Children's Film Festival. When it was in Chicago, a scout from another film festival company came and saw it and asked if it was okay if we showed it at the Sydney Opera House in Australia at the Little Big Shots. Oh my, yes, that was so exciting. So if you could be jealous of a brush, I definitely was, because this brush traveled more than I did. But the following year, it went on another tour. Our teachers said, you know, we love, at this point I started getting more connected, and they share out, shared out the video on Art Ed 2.0. And our teachers there said, I'm going to show this to my students. This is going to make a difference for our classroom. So somebody came up with the idea that it would be really nice if the actual brush, floppy brush, the actual brush actor could go and have a visit in their classroom and maybe stay for a week and then show the video and then we could send it to the next location. So we had a whole school year planned out for the floppy brush to make his tour and share his message and hopefully make a difference for paintbrushes across the country. So not now, but sometime maybe go back to the live binder and view the story of Young Sloppy Brush. I have more stories to share. Um, we just got on fire at Dryden for making movies. We call them feeble flicks, student-created art-related movies. And what we started thinking of is what are some of these universal themes? What can we tell a story about that will make a difference for other classrooms? And so the Glue Blues was another big hit. And you can see that it had also lots of authentic audiences. And whoops, I hit the wrong button. Here we go. It also was picked up by Wonderopolis and used as a featured movie when they want to talk about the science of glue. So we had an even larger audience simply because our movie was available online. They searched and they found it for um, advertising this post. Let's be green when it's time to clean answers the question of how to clean up the art room with, um, without wasting paper towel and making sure that we use our recycling bin. It actually gave a voice to the recycling bin, the sponge, the sink. Everybody had a little say in it. We used some special effects. The kids loved it. And of course, it was a musical. And so we found an authentic audience for that. But also, it was grabbed up by our, our online networks. So the newspaper wanted to write about it. It was entered into the National Geographic Find Your Footprint online contest. TeacherTube wanted to feature it for Earth Week. Um, it was also featured on the teaching palette for um, the month of March for Earth Day. And, and then stories were written about it through Education World and the Illinois Education Association. It just kind of went on. It was wonderful to be connected and to give our students that kind of audience. So again, please go back and watch this movie sometime when you have a chance, especially now that we had um, Earth Day, because this is a great way to teach your students to conserve, whether they're in the art room or not. I have stories to tell about careers in art, which you wouldn't think is a very exciting topic, but um, 
it ended up being a very exciting story for us. Uh, every year, for a number of years, my fourth graders would run into the art room. These are my Cub Scout fourth graders, and they'd say, tell us about careers in art so we can earn a badge. And But the problem is they'd run into the art room at recess time, and they would look at the clock and be holding a football in their hands, asking me to tell them about careers in art. So I knew I really didn't have a lot of quality time there to explain. And so I thought, okay, the next time this happens, I'm going to ask them to make a fugal flick. So this group of boys were the ones that I grabbed and I said, okay, you're going to make a movie that's going to explain what careers in art are. And it's going to be quick, it's going to be fun, and it'll be engaging. And unfortunately, it was really, really brief. So it wasn't very... Um, you know, didn't cover a lot of careers. But the kids loved working on it and came up with a really cute product. But as I was thinking about how brief it was, I thought, I'll make the intro for this movie and I'll base it on um, the way that 60 Minutes, the TV program, does their um, magazine look and then there's green screen and I'll try to figure this out. So I sat down one day in keynote in iMovie and I taught myself some tricks and when I figured it out how to create this illusion I got really excited and I tweeted it. So here's that tweet that I sent out and you can see I didn't copy anybody into this tweet. It was just to the world. Anybody who happens to read this, go ahead and read it because I'm excited. And um, Joe Brennan read it and he blogged for uh, Discovery Educators Network on digital storytelling, and he said, now tell us, you know, what's your secret? How'd you make it work? So I thought, well, that's really hard to explain in 140 characters. So what I did is I made a screencast video of all the steps, then I uploaded it to Vimeo, and I sent him the link to my movie. And after that, he thought, okay, you know, that's perfect. I'm going to blog about it, and I'll just embed your or, or link to what you posted for the tutorial and, of course, the final movie, Careers in Art, by your, your fourth grade Cub Scouts. So that was exciting because I had a larger audience through my students. Cub Scout movie, you know, Careers in Art, which I was thinking I would just show to future Cub Scouts. I really didn't know it was going to grow into something other people would want to see. But not only that, the people that follow Joe Brennan's blog um, saw his post, and one person was Martin Levin, who writes for Macworld Australia. And he was getting ready to write an article about creative ways to use Keynote software, which is um, part of the iWorks package on a Mac. And when he saw that I was using it to do that um, animation or intro to Creation Art, he asked if he could write about it for Macworld, and he included links to my tutorial and my students' careers in art video. So now our audience became international. Very exciting. But it didn't end there because I learned about Rushton Hurley and his nextvista.org not-for-profit organization. And in his organization, he asked um, students to make movies that teach something in 90 seconds or less of that you would learn in school. And it's kind of open-ended that way. And sometimes you could do it as a collaboration or a single student. And they have ongoing contests all the time. I was able to get in on a contest called um, Nebraska 90 through his not for, or non, or what was it called? Not for profit organization, Next Vista. And during that time, um, he chose finalists from all the entries and showed them to a live audience at a conference. And they used response systems to vote on their favorite movie, which happened to be Careers in Art. So we won that video contest. And then later, we found out that we also, Careers in Art was also chosen for a student video of the year. So we're really excited because their audience, again, was larger. And so when you get a moment, please take a um, a brief tour, brief and shallow investigation of careers in art. Um, and you'll find that link in the live binder. So I want to talk about 
some projects that happen during class time. Sometimes making movies in with normally making fugal flex is a special thing that we do, maybe during lunch recesses. But sometimes um, our use of technology is just kind of flowing into creation during our art projects. So this project that we called Shark, well, this video that we created celebrated a mistake. We were calling it a brilliant mistake. Um, and so now we call it shark dog. Whenever you want to talk about a brilliant mistake, you just call it a shark dog. And that's because of this image that you see on the left. Uh, this little guy, fourth grader, was trying to do a realistic drag dog. And that was the one that he ended up using for his pop art project. And you can see his final results there. He had a more realistic dog after he tried again. But that first dog, he was going to throw that away. And I grabbed it, and I'm like, you're kidding. This is amazing. This is the best looking shark slash dog I've ever seen. If I were going to try to draw a shark dog, I don't think I could have done it better than this. And I think that made my class really curious. And they started saying, hey, show us the shark dog. And they um, said, you know what? That shark dog is amazing. It deserves the same song. So while the kids were painting and drawing and working on their pop art project, we are also, at the same time, trying to brainstorm some lyrics for a shark dog song, which was a really silly thing. I thought, oh, well, I'll just go with it because we're being creative. So we are writing these lyrics on the board, and by the time class was over, we had a little something. And the next class of fourth graders came, and they're like, what's this shark dog thing? So I explained, and they said, well, let's put it to music. And um, so they recorded the song and then the next group of fourth graders came and they said you know what that song is awesome we love the shark dog it deserves to be a video and so it turned into a video so every fourth grader participated in celebrating our brilliant mistake and this ended up being such an exciting experience for me the way the kids just embraced the idea of transforming a mistake and and you know looking at it with new eyes and while they're working on an Andy Warhol inspired project, and this whole shark dog idea really tied in nicely with Andy Warhol and his attitude towards art creation. So I thought, you know what, I'm just going to write this up and submit it somewhere. So I found eSchool News and they published a story about that so shark dog. And so now their little movie and the whole um, events that happened while we're making our painting became something others could read and learn about. And it made a difference for a classroom in Wisconsin that I heard about. It might have made a difference otherwhere, in other places, but one teacher wrote and said that she's using Shark Dog as a symbol of I can when her students say I can't. And another teacher in South Carolina sent me this picture of a limousine cat, <laughs> which she said she loved. That's not the way cats really look, but if dogs could look like sharks, then cats could be as long as limousines, she said. So I also posted that on my website so we could all be inspired. And then in our teacher in Shanghai, China, writes a really cool um, blog called The Carrot Revolution, and he saw our shark dog video and post and reposted about it on his blog. And then he wrote me and said, is there any way I could have the image of shark dog so I can make a t-shirt out of it? So we put it up on Cafe Press, and now if you also want to have a shark dog t-shirt, I can send you a link for that too. <laughs> So here's a picture of him and his da daughter um, because they believe that mistakes can be brilliant. So here's another project. It's using technology in art, and it also gave us a larger audience when we shared it with our connected network. So these first graders were working on a project where they took a photo and overlaid their art on their photo. And we are looking at Nuffle Bunny and the Pigeon books, both by Mo Willems, the author. And so the kids are having so much fun coming up with rules in the art room. Don't let the pigeon this and don't let the pigeon that. And put it all together. And when we had our project, we sent a link to um, the author of the pigeon, Mo Willems. 
that he could take a look. And they were so excited to see that their work, inspired by this author, was viewed by the author himself. Well, that made us more excited about um, our author visit that we had with Ruth Spiro. She came to the classroom and read us her book called Vestra Fizz, The Bubblegum Artist. And we created a digital version of ourselves as a bubblegum artist. And we created a connection with her and continued our conversation later on Twitter. Artsonia has opened a lot of doors for my students. Artsonia is our online digital art gallery. This is just one example of a very cool thing that happened for my students. In New York City, they have a big screen plaza. and Artsonia created a partnership with them, and during the National Art Education Association Conference in New York City, they showed select student work from art teachers around the country. So student work, like over 500 pieces, were put on a 30-foot LED screen in the heart of New York City, near Broadway, um, in a slideshow to give these kids a very cool audience for their work and celebrate art education at the same time. I partnered with my local PBS um, network TV station a couple years ago, I guess two marches ago now. We were doing, we happened to be doing a project based on Dr. Seuss where we cat in a hat aside ourselves and drew a picture of ourselves reading our favorite Dr. Seuss book. We finished in time for Dr. Seuss's birthday in Read Across America. So I asked PBS if they would like to show some of my student work on their TV program or as a commercial to promote um, Dr. Seuss's birthday, and they went for it. And so I had 24 student pieces on TV running for the entire month every now and then, which was really cool because my kindergarten students were at home watching and seeing their art teacher and their class, school um, mates artwork on TV, which is so exciting. Doink is the animation app that I was um, mentioning earlier. I wrote a grant to receive it, and my students made these amazing little alien animations. And actually, I just finished posting this morning the updated version of this project. We tried it again this year, and um, they're even more cool, so if you want to take a peek at that sometime. So while we're working on this, I started communicating with the company, Joink, about what we were doing. And Joink loved it. So they started to tweet about what we were doing. They posted on their blog about what we were doing. So we were kind of cross-posting for each other. And then um, at the end of last year, I was asked to write an article for the I iPhone Life magazine, and they ended up publishing it about this project um, in the January, February edition. So you can see a little bit of that article picture right there. Pretty exciting. But I have more exciting news. IPVO um, has given my students lots of resources and exposure. And it's really a cool story. I'll try to say really quickly. But um, IPVO is a USB document camera, and I learned about it after I spent all my budget money. And I was really sad because the, um, the document camera that I had didn't work with my computer anymore after we did our software updates. So I wrote to IPVO, and I told them about how cool I, their product was and I, how much I wish I could have had one. And um, by any chance, you just want to give me one. <laughs> I can't help but laugh when I tell this story because that's a lot of nerve. I mean, I thought, you know what, I'm desperate. I, I know it would be great to have one. It would be great for my students. I'm just going to go out on the one and ask. So about a week later, an IP people showed up in the mail, and I had one. I was so excited, and I started figuring out all these cool ways of using it. At the time, I didn't have a way of projecting my iPad or my iPod. That came in handy. We used it for making movies. It worked really well with my interactive board. I loved it. And they said, you know what, could you write a little post about 
or an article about like your top six uses for IPvo, and I did, and then they posted those ideas on their blog and gave my students, including this movie, more exposure for their um, creative projects, which was so exciting. But then the story goes on. IPvo decided to open the doors and to other educators. So take note, ipvo.com slash wishpool. Go to this place and make a wish. Every month they're giving away something new. And do you see all those faces at the bottom of the slide? Those are the people in my personal learning network that I invited to make a wish and that I know already have had their wish granted for technology. You just make a wish and they it'll show up the way it did for me. It was amazing. And every month there's something new. So um, a couple more stories. This is our rotoscope animation project that we tried with fifth graders last year. And it was just um, a big idea that I didn't know if it would happen. Rotoscoping is when you make a video, you break the video down into individual images, and then the kids would draw over the image, and we'd have to collaboratively figure out a plan for how to draw so that everybody's drawings, when they're brought back together, could become an animation that looks like that video. So we figured it out with 100 kids and 335 images to draw. And we only had four sessions with the class set of iPads, and we made it work. And I documented the whole process into a movie. When we were all done, I found a contest to enter it into. The McGraw-Hill Stemmy Awards was looking for technology-based projects. Well, they would have taken a science or an engineering or a math project, too, but I want to put STEAM in the STEMI Awards, so this technology art-related project ended up winning second place and $5,000 for my students, which put more iPads back in my art room. My last plea is about this right now. This is um, looking, now that we have a few iPads that are permanently in the art room, I'm realizing that the ideal situation would be to have a one-to-one -one iPad ratio in the art room. And I found a way to get it if we could win <laughs> this contest. So if you're interested in paying it forward a little bit, please go to Trend Micro, What's Your Story, and find our movie project and give us a nice rating. Maybe comment, let us know that you're there, and give us some encouragement because this Tuesday is when they're going to pick their finalists and someone's going to win $10,000. So here again, I'm using my network now to help my students become more technology rich. Um, let's see. My last thing I want to do is end with this little movie. This um, movie will encourage you to push up your sleeves and, and try to connect your students and give them an authentic audience. So just like we did with the last movie, we're going to put this link in the chat. You can click on it. It's really short. And so in less than a minute, we'll come back and we'll finish up. Okay? Give us the um, red check when you're all done. All right, I think that is a lot of green checks, so hopefully you've been able to see the video. And thank you so much for listening to my spiel.
about why it's important to be technology rich and connected in the art room or any room. And now you can connect with me. Thank you so much, Tricia. Uh, one of the questions that I saw was, um, is your green screen, the, the cloth, was that placed over your drying rack? Oh, good question. It's actually over an old, old chalkboard that's on wheels. Oh, one of those. Okay. Um, I didn't see any other questions, but if you have a question that you would like to ask, please type those in the chat, or you can uh, click on the hand and we'll give you the mic and you can ask your question directly. I want to give you this opportunity to join in. Lori, did you have extra questions that I missed? I, yes, Kim, I did catch one more question. Is IPVO only for Mac computers? No, it's on PC also. And they have software that you install for whatever platform you are to run it for free. Great. That's great. And if you're if you place a grant there and your wish list is your wish story isn't accepted, they have some really affordable products. So thank you for sharing that with us. Some really great ways to use those document cameras. And um I'm just amazed at all the different things. I don't teach art, um, and when I did teach it, I was really poor at it. Um, so this is really exciting for uh, those who have to teach art who may not have this kind of background. Peggy, uh, before I close out the session, do you want to take over and? Uh, do the raffle after the question from Nikki. Uh, do you happen to know how much money you've accumulated so far with all of your grants, Tricia? I never added it up, but I do look around the room and think about how almost everything I have is because I begged or, <laughs> or um, wrote a grant or won a contest. I seem to have been at the beginning of the technology wave. So I was the first one to raise money and get an interactive board in my building. And then the next year, everybody was handed one. So if you look at my room now, everybody else is kind of caught up to me, but I had to earn everything I have where everybody else kind of had it given to them. Well, you were definitely what um, paving the way for uh, those to follow in your wake. And Shambles asked, are all of the staff at your school enthusiastic about teaching and using technology? I have a really wonderful staff. They're not my staff, but my building is really wonderful. And we call ourselves the land of the willing. So we say, we'll pilot it. We'll try it. Give us the, the stuff, and we'll just see if it works with kids. And so they have run a lot of pilots through us, and that's how I've had so much exposure to iPads for so many years. We piloted it up at my building first. Great. And we're talking about the iPivo document cameras. Connie, you can um, check that, and the link is in the live binders. <clears throat> And let me get that live by doing link. And make sure you have that open because you're going to need it to answer the questions for the raffle. And Tricia, you want to go ahead and do the raffle now? Sure. Well, first of all, if you, um, I, before I go to the first question, I want to prepare people for how to do this, how to answer. Um, just, let's see, type your answer in the chat. And we're going to try to pay attention to who was the winner and got the answer right. And then I'm going to have to email. You're going to need to um, reach me through email to get your prize because your prize is going to be a free app code from Doink for their animation app, which is amazing. I love it. 
So they actually saw that we were going to do this today, and I think they were hoping I was going to talk about them, and I can't help but want to talk about them. And so they offered to give me five free app codes. And so this is how we raffle it off. We're going to ask some trivia questions and see if you guys are paying attention. Are we good? Okay, here we go. What is the name of the video about a messy brush? If you know the answer to that, type it in. I talked about it. Or you can look in the live binder. Oh, we got it. So, Jill. So, you're going to need to email me. Congratulations. And next question. What is the name of the app that we use to animate aliens? Oh, boy. Somebody got it already. Connie, thank you very much. Please email me and we'll get you your raffle code for doink. Here's the next question. Which nonprofit site hosts student video contests about curricular content? Little hint. There was Rushton Hurley was a part of that. You know what? Oh, there we go. We've got a winner. Is that Sherry Edwards got it? Nextvista.org. Good job. Next question. Where do you go to make a wish for technology? What do you think that is? I P O yes, but slash. You know this. Slash. Add a little bit more. That's it. So I P O slash wish cool. Some people go right to I P O and they don't know what I'm talking about. But you know what, Sherry? Oh, Sheree. I'm probably saying your name wrong. Sorry. So, Sheree, you got that one. Thank you. I'm sorry if I was picky and we missed some people who knew IT well, but it's really important that you know it's the wish pull link. Okay, next one is where do you go to view and vote for Internet safety videos, particularly the one that's called The Internet Was Created for Good? Where's, where do you go for that one? Trend Micro, that's it. Susan T, thank you. All right, so we've got our winners. Make sure if you were one of the winners that you email me and we'll get you your free joint um, app code. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. And there's Trisha's um, email. And Trisha Jill asked if you could share her code with someone else. She may not have an iPad. Um, sure, just that's fine. I can send the code, and then you can send the code on to whoever. Okay, great. Yes, Jill can can share that with uh, one of her colleagues. Super. So uh, go ahead and email Tricia, Connie, and uh, Sherry, and those who won. Congratulations! And we're going to go ahead and close out the show. It's at the top of the hour, but we do invite you, if you do have other questions that you would like to ask that we haven't addressed, we want to let you know that coming up on May 8th, Steve Harganon is going to be conducting an interview with John Hunter, and on May 9th, he'll be talking with Peter Gray, and then on the 21st, Ernie Turner, and the 23rd, on Will Richardson on Why School and this, his book Why School is becoming very very popular and a lot of content and book studies are going on so you're going to definitely want to make sure that you're available for those great interview sessions with Steve Hargadon. Our upcoming schedule is on May 4th we're going to have our May featured teacher Heidi Beffert and May 11, Angela Myers will be back talking about Quest to Matter Challenge. And May 18th, we're working on uh, getting some things finalized. And then May 25th, we won't have a show for the Memorial Day holiday weekend in the USA. And then June 1st, our own Tammy Moore is going to be talking about Adobe Captivate and the great things that you can do with Adobe Captivate. Um, some amazing things that, uh, and Tammy is also just a beautiful artist. She has some fantastic artwork. Um, so if you haven't seen her just exquisite 
artwork, you're going to want to check that out. And we would love for you to nominate a featured teacher for one of our upcoming sessions. Just fill out that form. And the form is in the live binder so that you don't have to worry about copying in the link uh, or anything like that. All of the links are in the live binder so that you have easy access to it after the session. You can educate, you can name any educator, including yourself, for the um, upcoming featured teacher. And as soon as you exit today's session, a survey will automatically open in your browser. And you can, we would love to give you, uh, for you to give us feedback on today's session and give us some ideas for topics for future sessions in the survey. And anytime you watch one of the recordings, you can also fill out this survey using that same survey link to request a professional development certificate, as well as request one for today's session. Just put your name and email address, and Peggy will get that out to you. And then you can turn that in or uh, print it and put it on your wall to show your students that you're participating and lifelong learning. We also have an iTunes U channel that allows you to subscribe to the video MP4s and the audio MP3s or both so that you can take us with you wherever you go or you can subscribe via the RSS feed on our blog post from our website. And all of these links are um, being posted in the chat as well as in the live binders. So you can access those at any time to keep up to date. Or if you miss a session or want to replay it or share it with your colleagues, this is the best way to do that. And we want to give a very special thank you to Tricia today for taking time to share her wonderful, great ideas and all the <clears throat> excuse me unique things that she that you can do in art regarding whether that's your main content area or you teach the lower grades or not. All, <clears throat> excuse me. All of these ideas are adaptable. And we want to thank Steve Hargadon, who is our founder of our webinar series, and to Weebly for the great website that we're able to do, as well as to everybody who shared their ideas and, and uh, things in the chat today. So thank you so much, everybody. And if there are questions, we would love for you to take this last opportunity before we let everybody go for the day. Um, you can type them in the chat, or you can click on the hand, and we'll give you the mic, and you can ask them directly. Um, if there are any final questions, and all of all of Trisha's information is and contact information is included in the live binder in case you think of something later down the road uh, that that you might uh, once the session ends that you just thought of and you want to ask her a question or contact her about some of the things that she does and how she creates those wonderful projects with her students. Great. Wes, let me um, give you the mic using your iPad. I'm not sure if you can. There you go. Hey, I don't know if you can hear this or not. I just wanted to ask Patricia for any for advice you give for others that might want to use uh, AudioBoo on a, on a field trip since you did that successfully. Anything you do different or uh, change up the next time since, since you have good experiences with that? Okay. Um, is this Wesley Fryer? Um, Yes, it, it sure is. is. <laughs> okay. Hi, thank you so much for joining us um, and for giving me the idea to use AudioBoo on a field trip. What we did um, before we started, which was a really, I think, useful thing, is I created a widget for a hashtag and embedded that on my blog, which sounds really tricky, but it was really easy. Um, so I just made a hashtag for the field trip. And so for every AudioBoo tweet that we did, 
I added that hashtag, which automatically would show up in that widget on my blog. So when before I left, I um, asked the assistant principal to email all of the parents a link to my blog where they can go find one place where they could just see what's going on and hear what's going on on our field trip through that widget and that hashtag. So if anybody was paying attention, they would just go to my website and they would see the tweets aggregate through Audioboo. So I linked my Audioboo account to Twitter. And then here's what I would do differently. What I was doing was my iPhone and I had one account and I was interviewing kids and only the kids in my group because I chaperoned six individual kids and I was in a larger group at one point too but I just didn't give all of my students and all of their experiences a good you know exposure through this project of live tweeting so I think what I would do ahead of time is either train the other chaperones give them um, an iPod that's all hooked up and ready and ask them to go ahead and interview and snap pictures of kids on the field trip and use my same hashtag so we could have a broader experience and more students could have a voice and we could see more of the learning throughout the entire field trip. Does that all make sense? Absolutely. Those are great ideas. Um, we did a field trip this last week to one of our uh, history museums and the same kind of thing. I think advanced training of some parents would, would let even more kids participate. But it sure is good for the kids to be able to, to do that kind of sharing live. And thanks so much for giving that idea a try and taking it even further. Oh, sure. Thank you for sharing. And Sherry's asking, was the widget for Twitter or was it directly for Audioboo? Good question. It was a Twitter widget for the hashtag. Audioboo was connected to Twitter, so every Audioboo that we did went to Twitter, and then it would just show up. But later, when I was all done with the field trip, I created a board in Audioboo that was just dedicated to the, the postings that we had for the field trip. And then I embedded that board into my blog also. So if you didn't feel like going through the entire widget and clicking on everything, Audioboo sets up those boards so that you can click once and it'll just autoplay from one post to the next to the next to the next. It becomes like a little podcast that you're listening to. Great. And all of those items and her blog you can find in the live binder and check out how uh, some of the things that she's done and posted as well as to the wiki that uh, she, Peggy just posted in the chat. Some really great ideas that you'll want to explore when you have time. Thanks Wes for asking the question. Are there any other questions that um, have come to mind or that we might have missed along the way? If so, we'd love to have you take this opportunity to ask Tricia. Otherwise, you can contact her through the uh, information in her live binder and her blog and all of the things that she does online and Twitter as well. So it looks like we're going to go ahead and close out our session. And this has been so fantastic. I know people are out just getting ready to explore these things that you've shared with us today. And don't forget to email Tricia if you were one of the winners. And if you're not able to use that code like she said, pass it on to another teacher who can. Or, um, and if you don't have an iPad, you can share that with somebody who um, might be ready to use that with their students. So thank you everybody for joining us today. Be sure to join us for an, our May featured teacher next week and have a wonderful weekend. Um, hopefully the weather's warming up wherever you are in the world and the U.S. that is. Um, and 
Take care, everybody. We hope to see you next week and see you online. Take care.